Hey, good ev- good evening, everybody. How are you doing? It's Dr. Dietrich. I'm here on another episode of some great information for y'all. And we're just going to wait and see who chimes in. We have a very special guest tonight. Hello, Dr. Nasreen. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Very good. So we're going to, we usually just give a couple of seconds to see who's going to chime in. Um, it's, it's always a little bit of a lag, but we, um, it's good to wait till people come in. Okay. Okay. I think we need to see who's coming in. I think we are. So how's the weather where you are? <laughs> it's been nice this week. It's been sunny and warm. Uh, feels like beach weather, but I can't be on the beach right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> oh, good. So, yeah, okay, so I see uh, a person is coming in, so I know we're live. Um, I'm probably just going to get started. It's a little bit of an introduction and whatnot. So thank you very much, you all, for joining me tonight. I'm Dr. Dietrich, and I'm very happy to be here because we have our very special guest with us, right? And I'm telling you, you are going to want to be here tonight, so please tag people um, to watch this. Anyone you know of who has a heart and is beating, you want to listen to this live. <laughs> so um, just tag people and uh, please share this, host, a, do a watch party and whatnot. Um, I'm happy to be here with Dr. Nasreen Ibrahim. Okay, she is a physician. She is uh, board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, transplant, and congestive heart failure. Yeah, I said all that. Yeah, all of that. So, you know, she's bad. <laughs> you don't want to miss it, right? So please, when you all are logging on, please put in the chat where you are watching this from. We would love to to see that. And I see a couple of people coming in. Thank you, Gilda. Thank you, Kasali, for coming in. And we just wait a couple more seconds. Um, But in the meantime, before we get started, I wanted to ask you all, did you know that uh, June is National Men's Health Month? Did you know that? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so, tag, yeah, so, <laughs> so tag the fellas who are out there as well, but this live is for anyone. Like I said, if your your heart is beating, you need to listen to this, all right? So did you know that the number one cause of death in the U.S. is heart disease? The number one cause of death in men is heart disease. The number one cause of death in women is heart disease. So needless to say, this is serious stuff, right? And of course, you need your heart to survive. And so it's very important that we take care of it. And tonight, we're actually going to be talking about your heart, um, how stress affects your heart, how you can take care of your heart. Is your heart healthy? Um, About heart attacks, just so much information. So, you know, come on in and and listen to us. And um, okay, so I'll go ahead and get started if that's okay. Um, and formally introduce my my guest, um, my medical mobile little sister, Dr. Nasreen Ibrahim. She is again a board certified internal medicine doctor, board certified in cardiology, congestive heart failure, and heart transplant medicine. That's amazing. And we actually met through our business coaching program, Medical Moguls, with Dr. Dre, and he's our mentor and our business coach, and he brought us together, right? And so I'm just saying I'm very looking forward to getting to know you better and cultivating our relationship in this journey. And I'm really glad I met you. And it seems like we're going to have a lot in common. So before I get extra mushy, I'm going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> certainly, certainly. But, you know, when, before we get started, I would love for you to just kind of start us off by telling us a little bit more about yourself and you know, what, what is your expertise and what is your plight? What are you, what are you actually doing? So I am an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist, like you mentioned. So I take care of patients that have congestive heart failure and we start with seeing if they can improve just on medications alone. And then sometimes the patients don't get better on medications. And we have to talk about things like heart transplant and mechanical heart pumps, like left ventricular assist devices. So it's across the spectrum of congestive heart failure, but I also see patients that just have general cardiology um, 
concerns and issues that need to be managed. So from a medical standpoint, my biggest goal is to make sure that patients are on the appropriate medications for congestive heart failure, but also that if patients are not doing well on medications, that they get referred at an appropriate time so that we can consider them a candidate for a heart transplant or mechanical heart pump. Um, it's really distressing when patients are sent to us too late and they're too sick to you know, benefit from any of those therapies, especially mm -hmm. for transplant. Um, my other big thing is physician wellness. I think it's something that's very overlooked. We talk about it, we blog about it, but in reality, um, you know, as physicians, we don't really take that great care of ourselves. And I think it's really important that we do uh, make sure that we are well so that we can provide the best care for our patients. So that's something I'm very passionate about. I love to write about it, read about it, um, and talk about it. So those are my two big things. Make sure heart failure patients get world-class care, no matter their socioeconomic status or their background, and then make sure physicians take care of themselves. Oh, excellent, excellent. I'm really glad you said that because that leads me to a, a, a question I have actually. Let me start this whole thing off by asking, do you have stress? <laughs> a lot of stress. <laughs> Uh, like all of us do. <laughs> Where do you have stress? Is it at work? Is it at home or what? <laughs> it's at work. So uh -huh. I don't have, I'm not married and I don't have kids. So I don't have that stress. But at <laughs> work, um, stress at work because I like to do a lot. I'm a researcher, but I also take care of very sick patients. So that adds um, a good amount of stress. So of course I have stress. I'm only human. <laughs> And I'm excited yes, to hear from you how to manage my stress because I don't do it as well as I need to. Yes, ma'am. Great, great, great. So, yeah, all of y'all out there listening, I see more people are joining us tonight. Thank you very much for taking time. Um, y'all know, you know, on my page, I'm America's Relaxation Doctor, and I actually help people who are stressed at work learn to relax and refocus in order to have a more healthy, productive, and fulfilled life. And a part of this whole platform is education. I'm here to educate you along today with our guest, with our guest speaker, um, the effects of stress on the heart, as well as other heart issues and how you can improve your overall heart health. And I want to uh, start the conversation about what I said earlier um, about the number one cause of death in the U.S. is heart disease. And I really want to start off by asking you, um, what is the difference between like a heart attack and heart disease? Some of the people out there listening may think it's the same thing, but it's not necessarily the same thing. What What is heart disease versus a heart attack? So heart disease is anything that could be wrong with the heart. So it could be um, that one of the valves of the heart is is sick. It's too either too tight or it's you know too wide and it's causing blood to leak backwards. Um, it could be. Um, mm -hmm heart disease, like one of the ventricles of the heart, meaning one of the muscles that pump blood to the rest of the body, the muscle can be weak, or mm -hmm. it can be that you have plaque buildup in any of the arteries of your heart. So heart disease really means um, a term that encompasses anything that could Everything. be wrong with your heart. Okay, okay. Yeah, but a heart attack specifically happens when, you know, the plaque that builds up within the arteries of the heart and inflammation um, builds up and then that plaque breaks off and causes a blockage in the artery of the heart or in that vessel and that's what causes a heart attack. Oh, okay, all right. So let me ask you this then, how do you know or how can a person tell if their heart is healthy? Well, prevention is the best thing and I, I would say mm -hmm. even physicians, we're not good at this ourselves, is the first mm -hmm. thing is to make sure that people go and see their primary care doctors because sometimes there can be subtle things that you don't realize are wrong with you. And maybe a routine exam, the doctor can hear a murmur in the heart. Or if they do an EKG, they can see something that's wrong um, or concerning on the EKG. So the most important thing to make sure that somebody is not only that their heart is well, but that the risk factors that cause heart disease are also um, checked out is to see a primary care doctor on a routine basis and make sure to get that annual exam. Um, okay. But there are symptoms that can, you know, tell you if you have heart disease or not as well. 
Oh, good. That's exactly what I wanted to ask for my day's question. How can a person know if their heart isn't necessarily doing the best or if it's not so healthy? How would they know? So the most obvious and I think the most well-known sign would be chest pain or chest mm -hmm. pressure, chest discomfort. But it's important to remember that that is not the only sign of heart disease. Sometimes mm -hmm. patients have trouble breathing, they're short of breath, um, they might have swelling in their legs, um, mm -hmm. they might lie down at night and feel like they can't breathe, that they're suffocating. And then sometimes it's the jaw pain, the neck pain. Um, it's important to remember in diabetic patients, sometimes they'll never have chest pain. They'll have like this sensation of indigestion or this nausea and vomiting that's not going away. So that could also be a sign of a heart attack. Um, mm -hmm. What I also tell people they don't, that people don't remember is um, say, you know, like a year ago, they could climb three flights of stairs easily. But now when they climb just one flight of stairs, they're huffing and puffing and they feel exhausted. That could also be a sign that the heart is sick and it's not doing as well as it should be. Okay, that makes sense. It's like if there's a change in what you normally normally do. Okay, okay. Very good. Okay. So I know this, you know, stress is one of the things that can affect us many aspects of our, our lives, our mental health, our physical well-being, and definitely the heart is no different. And when a person is acutely stressed, a bunch of things go on in the body. Um, stress hormones are released. The heart rate increases, the breathing increases, um, blood pressure increases. And you have a, a phenomenon called vasoconstriction of some blood vessels in your body. I'm just, you know, kind of going over the, the stress response. And when you have this vasoconstriction, your body basically knows what blood vessels it needs to constrict it in order to divert blood flow to those organs and muscles that need the need the, um, the blood to get going. So, for example, um, your muscles have increased blood flow so they can work faster and work harder to get you out of a dangerous situation. Um, whereas blood flow to your stomach, even though blood flow is still going there, um, it may not be as robust because you don't need to be sitting down eating a nice meal when you're in an acutely stressful situation um, because there's, you know, there's times of danger that you need to flee. Um, so your body has a way of perceiving acute stress and then acting accordingly. But after your, your perceived stress is gone, um, your body needs to get back to that calm state or that homeostasis, okay? But it's times when you're in this chronic, stressed out, fight or flight, I got to fight for my life state, which is that acute stress response. I know that these stress mediators can eventually lead to changes inside those blood vessels on a, a more of a inside in the inside of the, the blood vessels they can lead to some serious serious um issues including the heart so i kind of wanted to ask you um in what way if you can you kind of explain exactly how does um being chronically stressed set you up for heart disease or like a heart attack i know that's a really big question but you know being in a, a chronic state is not good if you can't manage it so how does that kind of affect the heart yeah, so as you mentioned, that flight or flight, fight or flight response is really important, but it becomes mm -hmm. counterproductive when you're, say, sitting in traffic and that's what's stressing you out. So more research is needed, but we think that stress increases inflammation and mm -hmm. inflammation is not good for any organ or blood vessel in the body. And so that can contribute to heart disease, but also having your blood pressure constantly high, your heart mm -hmm. rate high, eventually the heart is a pump and it has to pump against this high pressure system, which is the high blood pressure. Eventually the heart gets sick um, just being in that atmosphere with the high blood pressure, um, high heart rate and this inflammatory state. But I think most important is that we know when people are stressed, they do, you know, they might cope by doing things that are directly harmful to the heart. You know, I'm right. sure you can talk more about those, yes. like smoking and yes. uh, overeating. All of those directly contribute to heart disease. Oh, good. Yes, I'm definitely going to touch on that in a second. Um, just in my research for this live stream, I came across the term called like stress induced. Uh, cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. Uh, what What is that? Or have you heard of that? So that's yeah. very, very real. 
Um, uh, and it usually happens in conditions of severe stress. We've mm -hmm. seen it happen when um, during a divorce. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen it happen when a patient has lost a loved one suddenly. So it's under conditions of extreme stress. It is more common in women. And the heart muscle literally all of a sudden, because of the increase in all of these stress hormones and catecholamines, it, the heart muscle just gets weak and you get, you know, heart failure. Sometimes um, it's severe to the point where we need to put patients on artificial devices to help support the heart. But at other times it's not as bad. And usually with the correct medications, we can reverse that process. But it, it is real. It's true. Broken heart syndrome. And it happens under conditions of significant a very, very stressful situation for the patient. Oh, boy. Yes. I was just like, oh, my goodness. And, you know, sorry, people have to, you know, get to that point or they, they go through that because I know it's, I'm sure it's not, it's just not good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so um, I know, uh, unfortunately, that some people actually, like you kind of alluded to, re resort to poor coping mechanisms and um, habits, you know, to deal with their stress, like drinking um, alcohol excessively, uh, smoking, uh, smoking cigarettes, you know, even drugs, overeating, you know, all that stuff. And having, they're doing this to have a temporary escape from their perceived stressors, right? And I know it can't be good, you know, for your heart, especially in the long term. So um, can you tell us like how these things can affect us? Like how does alcohol actually hurt the heart? How does it hurt the heart? How does cigarette smoking hurt the heart? We know that it does, but how? How does overeating hurt the heart? You know, maybe if people out there who can actually hear how it's actually you know, detrimental to the heart, maybe it could be some type of a, a, a jolt to get us to change our behavior. So how do these things actually cause heart problems? So I would offer overeating. So overeating, including you know fatty foods and excessive amounts of sugar, can lead to things like high cholesterol. And mm -hmm. high cholesterol just means you know you're putting your heart at a risk for developing the plaque in the arteries that cause heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Then high diets that are high in sugar can cause diabetes, and we know diabetes is one of really the most um, dangerous diseases in terms of it affects every single organ, including the heart, and can cause not just heart attacks, but can cause congestive heart failure, meaning that pump, the main pump muscle of the heart is now weak. Mm -hmm. um, smoking is not good. It causes a higher risk for heart attacks and strokes. Um, and then excessive alcohol use, alcohol in excessive amounts is actually a poison to the heart and can weaken the heart muscle and cause congestive heart failure as well um, at all ages. We've seen young patients come in, and I mean young patients in their 40s that have come in because of um, you know, excessive alcohol use and their heart muscle now um, is weak. Sometimes when they stop drinking, the heart muscle gets better, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then we talk about things like transplant. So it's not always reversible. So all of these things, I look at them as toxins to the heart. And then um, cocaine, methamphetamine, those types of illicits are also directly damaging to the heart, can cause heart attacks and also can cause heart failure. Um, so it's important, all of the coping mechanisms that are that patients are using to manage their stress are more healthy. And I, again, I'm not saying everybody's perfect, everybody's always right. going to be perfect, but right. there has to be some mechanism where you're limiting these things that are very damaging to the heart. Right, right. Uh, I totally get you. <laughs> so, like, we're humans too, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I know when people are stressed, they have anxiety as well, more, more than likely. Your mind is just racing. Um, you're thinking about so many different things. You just can't get to sleep. You have this insomnia, right? And a person um, may experience this uh, insomnia when they have this chronic stress. And so, I know that um, the brain and the body needs time to recharge, um, to do what it needs to do, to heal, you know, and you do this by sleeping. And I, I can remember like a few times when, you know, I was on call um, where I've had the, the really, really long hours. And um, I literally like 
went to work the next day, you know, and I would be without sleep literally for like 24 to 30 hours. And, you know, it was pretty rough. And it, not only that my mind was off, of course it was, but I just remember, and this probably was like a year or so ago, um, I just felt like tired in my core. You know what I mean? I just felt it like, I just felt like heavy and just so tired. Now I know, you know, you need to go to sleep and it, it went away after I got a good night's sleep. But um, is there is there like a mechanism or something that being chronically sleep deprived can actually hurt your heart? I think it goes along with what behaviors end up happening yeah. when you're sleep deprived. Cause I uh -huh. look at myself too, the nights that I'm on call and um, I'm up all night doing donor call. Those are the days where I make excuses not to work out. I make excuses to eat whatever I want. So it becomes the maladaptive behaviors that okay. end up being bad for your heart because you're stressed, you're anxious now, your heart rate's up, your blood pressure's up, you're eating whatever you want to do, you're skipping the gym because you're you know chronically tired. So all of those behaviors that um, you end up uh, you know, taking or, you know, participating in make you make it worse, make your risk for heart disease worse. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so this was really great. I want to just pause for a second. I see a bunch of people are in. I want to acknowledge some of these folks here and see if there's any questions or, or comments. Um, I, I said hi to Gildan Kasali, Dr. Natalie, Amber Gee. Thank you so much. Uh, Teresa, Dr. Teresa, thank you so much. Dr. Dia, Dr. Victoria, <laughs> hi Estella, Mary Lou, uh, Chanel Parker, thank you so much. Hey Lauren, thank you very much. Thank y'all very much for joining us. Thank you for the compliments too. So if y'all have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're going to keep it moving. OK, but yeah, this is a great live. And, you know, please tag people to come watch. Um, we're not done yet. So please come on in. And if you are joining us late, please, you know, watch it on the replay as well. All right. So let's go ahead and keep on going. Uh, we've had a lot of information about stress and what it does. And we're talking about the effects of stress in the heart. And now I kind of want to transition on how we can actually help the heart. Um, how we can improve our heart health and strengthen the heart. And I know from my standpoint that finding ways to learn how to manage your stress is very beneficial for heart health. I mean, I talk about relaxation techniques and one of the ways that I educate people um, to help with stress reduction is to actually do some deep breathing, um, meaningful breathing. This kind of helps slow things down. It decreases your heart rate. It decreases your blood pressure and all that in the immediate. Now, you know, please keep in mind, um, I don't mean just stop what you're doing and start deep breathing and slow things down if you're being chased by a dog. No, I don't mean that kind of, you know, slow it down. <laughs> like if you need to do, you know, have something that you need to be, that you're going to be stressed doing like a presentation or completing a task. That's fine. But what I mean is um, when the acute stress is over, you need to have ways to calm things down. All right. And there are, of course, other ways that, you know, a person can, um, learn how to relax and manage their overall stressors, in addition to uh, deep breathing, uh, such as turning to your faith, you know, for comfort, um, clarity, calm, and reassurance. This is great. Um, also being with loved ones, um, laughing, um, coloring, massage, self-care, all that stuff, um, exercise, that kind of stuff, it, eventually it makes you uh, more calmer in general. And all these things help promote relaxation. Um, now, in the work setting, because, you know, I talk about the work setting where I know there are where a lot of stress, you know, goes on in the work setting. Um, there's some things that you can do to help promote calm while get, still getting your job done. And um, this is mainly, mainly by um, utilizing your break time, um, listening to relaxation music, um, again, coloring, deep breathing, having a nice lunch with uh, positive coworkers. Um, you know, um, just, you know, being off to yourself, you know, getting fresh air, that kind of thing. Um, and then when you get back to your job, that you'll be more charged and, you know, ready to go. Now, let me ask you this. What do you like to do for relaxation? What do you like to do, Dr. Nasreen? So I love going to my boot camp class that I haven't been able to go to because of COVID. So that's uh -huh. what oh, biggest ways of you know relieving stress was you know waking up really early in the morning and going to uh, a boot camp class but my oh. other 
thing that I started doing within the last year was meditation. Um, wow. It was recommended to me by my leadership coach, and I did not <laughs> crazy. I was like, is this guy crazy? I don't <laughs> like it still. What is he talking about? But I listened to him and I did it and it really changed my life in terms of I noticed I was sleeping better. I was focusing better. I was just calm throughout the day. So morning meditation really, really made a difference um, in my stress levels. Oh, excellent. That's definitely something that people should really look into and, you know, learn about it too. Um, don't don't go into it thinking you you think you know because a lot of people may think that uh, meditation has to do with something that's you know weird or occult but it's basically just calming your mind and and centering yourself getting yourself prepared for the day and connecting with yourself so you know definitely look into that people that are out there listening i see a couple more folks coming in hi dr tanya thank you um right now i still want to transition into uh strengthening the heart or making the heart as healthy as possible for us when we do experience those stressful times. And um, I know what you were talking about your boot camp. I know exercise is something um, that is a known activity that can actually benefit your heart. But I wanted to ask, um, I know there's some people who are out there who may not be in the best of health or they actually have a diagnosis of heart disease, CHF. Um, they've had a heart attack in the past. And I wanna ask, can people who, who have these conditions still be able to exercise. Now, I know this is a general statement and you're not giving specific medical advice to people, but just kind of in general, does that automatically mean if a person has heart disease that they cannot exercise? Not at all. But the most important thing for anybody listening is, you know, check with your primary care doctor or your cardiologist before you start any exercise regimen. But Definitely, we love exercise. Uh, patients have better outcomes when they exercise. We actually, when patients come into the hospital and have a heart attack and you know, we put a stent in or they have open heart surgery, after they leave the hospital, we recommend cardiac rehab where they exercise in a monitored environment. Because if you think about it, after a patient has a heart attack, sometimes they're afraid to work out. So we send yeah. them yeah, so we send them to cardiac rehab, they're monitored, they start slow, they increase the intensity of the exercise over a few weeks. And patients love it because, um, you know, they just learn what their limitations are. Same thing of patients with congestive heart failure, we recommend them to cardiac rehab because we want them to exercise in a, you know, in a monitored environment, they learn mm -hmm. Um, what they can do. They're less anxious. Um, you know, they're mm -hmm. there for six to eight weeks and then they graduate and they're able to exercise on their own. But exercise is a key thing in a preventing heart disease, but also um, it's beneficial in patients that are diagnosed with, you know, all types of heart disease. Okay. So the actual act of exercising actually strengthens the heart or what, what does it do? It just gets the blood flowing better or just makes the heart stronger or? It doesn't make the heart stronger, but it helps keep patients out of the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. It improves patients' mood. Patients feel better when they meet people, they exercise around other people that also have similar conditions, especially when they go to cardiac rehab. Um, but it has been shown to, you know, in the long term, keep patients um, out of the hospital and living longer. Okay, excellent. Is there, any, for people who don't have heart disease, is there, are there any recommendations for people, uh, what type of exercise to get started on if they're really not an avid exerciser? I understand that walking is like one of the best exercises you can do. Um, any thoughts about that? So I always, any, any little bit of exercise is better than nothing. So I say start slow, even if you're just walking 15 minutes a day, even if it's 10 minutes a day, and then each day just increase how much you're walking. Um, you want to do uh, exercise that increases your heart rate. You want to do something that makes you sweat. But it's always better to just start slow and then gradually increase the amount of exercise you're doing. Okay, excellent. Um, I have a, a question here from um, Amber for you. Um, um, she did say her father passed away in 2002 because of a heart attack. The doctor told my family that he would be alive if he ate single bear aspirin. What are the benefits of aspirin that will allow a person to survive a heart attack? 
So aspirin is an anti agent, which means, um, you know, we talked about that plaque that builds up in the arteries of the heart. The aspirin mm -hmm. prevents that plaque from rupturing. So if he did have plaque buildup in his arteries, um, you know, ideally we put patients on aspirin and we also put them on a cholesterol medicine, you know, like it's called a statin, some sort of statin that reduces inflammation and prevents that plaque from breaking off or rupturing and causing a heart attack. Um, so that's why we use aspirin. Okay. And I, I remember too, like if you feel somebody's getting ready to have a heart attack or you think they do, you have them like chew an aspirin, like in the acute setting. Is that just to help with, um, like, if there was, like, a clot or something? or mm -hmm. Okay. So that's it. Um, I have another uh, question from a patient. I'm going to actually encourage her to call the clinic tomorrow. <laughs> so we don't um, talk about that on live. <laughs> okay. Thank you for asking, though. But, yeah, go ahead and please call the clinic, okay? <laughs> okay. So one of the things that I, I talk about for stress reduction is actually using the senses to help promote calm. Um, and one of those senses are, are taste, all right? And now that I mentioned before, um, one of the uh, not so beneficial coping mechanisms for dealing with uh, stress is, you know, overeating or poor food choices. And sometimes, you know, when a person is stressed, they're gonna go for the foods that are quick and delicious and sweet and crunchy or all of the above. Um, but I can say, you know, that they're not, you know, the most healthy. Um, and I know that this on the long term can have negative effects on the heart, um, among other aspects of health. Um, so can you tell us, do you know of any foods that we can eat that are more considered more heart healthy um, or at least heart neutral or won't hurt the heart? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. That's good. Bad for your heart. Unfortunately. <laughs> yes. yes things um, that are good for your heart. We talk about, you know, fruits, uh, especially berries are anti have antioxidants in them. Um, mm -hmm. Vegetables, green leafy vegetables, um, vegetables that are green, um, uh, vegetables, sorry, that are orange and um, red. Uh, we talk about healthy nuts like almonds and walnuts. Um, fish has omega-3, uh, which is very good. Uh, dark chocolate is something that patients don't always think about, but it does have yep. antioxidants and it's good for a little bit of flavor. Um, so lots of choices. Some of the legumes are also good for the heart. But I also try to tell my patients that, you know, they are human just like I'm human. So there's going to be days that, you know, they are going to quote unquote cheat and go for a meal mm -hmm. that's more fatty or has a little more sugar than I'd like or more salt than I'd like, but I just like to say that don't make that a habit. You know, I have the same issue when I'm stressed, I don't eat well. Um, and so don't make that a habit, minimize the fatty foods, minimize the fried foods, um, and then try to make, you know, the vegetables, you can try to season them, the fish, you can try to season it, that it tastes good to you. So try to be creative with the healthy foods and also minimizing the salt, cause you know, salt, oh, yeah water retention and water retention, blood pressure. Mm -hmm. blood pressure. Yep. What are your thoughts about like olive oil? Yeah, it has some benefits. Again, it's not, um, you know, very lots of data behind it, but people use it and it's healthier to use to cook and also in salads. So definitely olive oil. Okay. All right. All right, let me see. Uh, I think we don't have any more questions, so this is good. This has been just really such a, a great time. Um, I've really learned a whole lot, and I hope all y'all out there who are listening have, have learned a lot. And, you know, if you have any questions, we're just about getting ready to wrap it up. Please put them in there, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, again, for those of us who did join us later in this live stream, I would definitely encourage you to go back and watch it and hit put re replay, hashtag replay in the chat and share this uh, this live stream. OK, um, thank you very much, Dr. Nasreen, for joining us. Do you have any final thoughts or anything that you can share with us out there? Um, how can we find you on social media? I want to start following you. What can the people do? <laughs> so, the heart is the most important organ in the body. So make sure yes. to take good care of it. 
And I would uh -huh. love if you practiced prevention so that I would be out of a job that you wouldn't even need a cardiologist. So exercise, eat right, see your primary care doctor to make sure that your sugars are under control, your blood pressures are under control. Um, and so, you know, I would be happy to not have to see you in clinic. Um, <laughs> You can follow me on my Facebook fan page. It's Dr. Nasreen. So D-R and then Nasreen is N-A-S-R-I-E-N. -E oh, good. And I know February is like Heart Health Month. So I'm hoping we can um, rekindle and come back in February and, you know, talk more about the heart. You know, if you have the time, it would be great to, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, so, um, uh, earlier, I actually talked about uh, in order to help manage chronic stress, you need to have beneficial uh, stress reducing techniques. And one of the things I actually talked about was coloring, right? And so it just so happens that I'm the author to an Amazon best selling coloring book, uh, Relaxed and Ready, an inspirational uh, guide to help you calm your mind. And uh, coloring, just to let y'all know out there, coloring is fun, it's non caloric, so it's not going to put any calories on you. It's a great way to reduce your stress and so i would love it if you all have some interest you can uh, go to the website relaxed and ready coloring book.com i'll put it in the chat after this live stream is done um, so again thank you so much dr nasreen for joining me tonight um, i'm dr dietrich gorman i am a board certified family practice physician i am a three-time best-selling author and a speaker and i'm also known as america's relaxation doctor and I help individuals who are stressed at work learn to relax and refocus in order to have a more healthy, productive, and fulfilled life. And I know you want this for yourself. And if you do, I would please encourage you to follow me on all social media at Dr. Dietrich G. That is D-R-D-E-I-T-R-I-C-K-G. Or visit my website at drdietrichg.com. Again, thank y'all very much for joining us tonight. Please remember to take care of yourself, take care of your heart. Be nice to each other and above all, relax well. I'll see y'all next time. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.